BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello and welcome to the Scottish Football Podcast on Tuesday the 30th of April. I'm Phil Goodlad and as ever we've got an action-packed episode for you today. Not O'Reilly into the box, going to shoot with the right foot! Oh, it's sensational! Oh, Tavernier! In it goes this time! Jack Butland with another fantastic stop. Shanklin Jen scores! The Player of the Year nominations are out. Who should claim the prize and who should be on the shortlist that isn't? Also, some good news about this guy. It might break McTominay's way. It does! Go! Scott McTominay does it yet again! We have the latest on Scott McTominay's injury, but could the Manchester United midfielder be on the move? And... There is goal threats in this team, and a um, lot of kind of experience, and then they know how to get it done. We'll get the inside track on Scotland's Euro 2024 opponent, Switzerland, ahead of the finals, which start in 45 days' time. This is the Scottish Football Podcast from BBC Sports Scotland. Great to have you along this morning. I'm joined by Michael Grant, the wise old owl of uh, Scottish football from The Times, and Craig King, who runs the Football Swiss English Twitter page. Uh, to you and me, it covers all things Swiss football. Morning, gentlemen. Morning. Morning, Phil. Craig, that is some job you have. <laughs> well, it's more of a uh, passion, really, but... It's something that's kind of started organically like a decade ago now. Um, I just randomly decided to start uh, watching Swiss football games, Basel games specifically, and then created a, a Twitter account off the back of that in English because there wasn't one. And um, yeah, it's kind of made me the, the voice in English of Swiss football, which is not something that I ever expected to, to say to anyone. But uh, yeah, here we are. When you say you randomly started to watch Swiss football, did you just come in one night and sit down and think, I know, I've got an idea? Well, basically there was Champions League games on. It was a random Tuesday, I believe. And um, back then you could you could choose pretty much any game you, you wanted to watch. And it was the only time a team like Basel would be on TV in the UK and they were playing a Romanian team that don't even exist anymore. And um, they, <laughs> they won that game. And then I decided I'm going to start watching more of their games. I, I remember the kits from years ago, some of the players. I thought I'm going to try and watch as much as I can. The next time they, yeah. they were on TV again was Champions League. They played Manchester United at Old Trafford. We were winning the game until the very last minute, drew a free each. And again, that kind of made me more interested. I often wonder what would have happened if they'd lost that game easily. As everyone expected, <laughs> I probably would have said, you know what, just uh, get no, no more interest in this. But yeah, um, yeah, from there I just watched more and more and then I decided to make the account, the Twitter account and watch pretty much every team. So it's kind of, it's went from that now to more or less every every game, every team, the, the um, women's side of it as well and the national team. So Listen, we'll cover the, the national side with uh, with Switzerland and more importantly how we beat them at the uh, the Euros. Uh, lots to get through today though, so let's uh, kick off with some, uh, some Scottish football headlines. Celtics Matt O'Reilly, heart striker Lawrence Shankland and the Rangers duo Jack Butland and James Tavernier. They've all been nominated for the PFA Scotland Player of the Year award. Shankland says he expects conversations will be had with his club about his future come the end of the season. Scott McTominay has said that he expects to be back soon after describing an injury sustained at the weekend as nothing serious. It comes as it's understood as club Manchester United are willing to listen to offers for nearly all the first-team squad, including the talismanic Scotland midfielder. And it's being reported that Highland League champions Bucky Thistle have decided to drop their dispute with the SFA and SPFL over their pyramid playoff ban. Let's start with those PFA Player of the Year and Young Player of the Year nominations. Uh, Michael, you were uh, you were in the thick of it yesterday at the nominations uh, ceremony. Uh, can you argue with the shortlist, O'Reilly, Shankland, Butland, Tavernier? Yes, yes, I will argue with the shortlist because I'm baffled at the omission of Bojan Majowski of Aberdeen. To be honest, I think really the two strongest player of the year candidates are Majowski and Lauren Shankland. Certainly O'Reilly and Tavernier and Butland have had sound seasons, but I think the player of the year should always have a kind of wow factor about him. It should be... It should be a guy that everybody has been talking about for the the strength of his season. And I think that only applies really to those two 
to Shankland and to Miofsky. Michael, I wonder though, because this is the Player of the Year nominations, uh, you and I and everybody else in the, the Scottish football media have been speaking about Miofsky. Perhaps in the dressing rooms, the, the players who make the nominations, they haven't. Yeah, sure, certainly. I mean, I think the, the PFA Scotland Award tends to have an old firm leaning in it. You know, the the winners are nearly always from the old firm. I think it's more than a decade since it wasn't a Rangers or Celtic player. Now, you understand that. Those two clubs have the best players. Those two clubs tend to have the outstanding player every season. But I think there also is a duty on all of us who have any kind of um, say in Player of the Year awards, which uh, I do in the Scottish Football, as a member of the Scottish Football Association, I can vote for our one. Um, and, I, and that's why I would... I, I mean, I think Shankland is the is the outstanding player of this season. Um, I think he's... He's on 29 goals. He scored uh, five, I think, against the old firm. He scored in Europe. He scored a last-minute winner against Hibs. He had a run of 16 goals in 15 games between, I think it was December and March. He scored for Scotland against uh, Georgia, where he doesn't get an awful lot of game time for Scotland. Um, 29 goals for the season. He has been the guy that players have been, uh, sorry, that fans have been talking about more than anybody. I think it's beyond dispute that Shankland has had a, an extraordinary season, season of his career. He's gone from being, does he make it to Germany, to does he start in Germany? So, for me, he's the winner. Um, but, you know, the guys on the, on the, the guys on the shortlist have had good seasons. Of course they have. Of course they have. But I, I am perplexed that Miofsky isn't considered one of the best four of this season. Mm. Michael, one of the, the great things, if we cast our eye to the, to the young player of the year, is just the solid crop of young players that, that's been named. Lyle Cameron at Dundee, Davy Watson at Kilmarnock, uh, Motherwell's Lennon Miller, who's been in the headlines throughout the season for his uh, performances, and Ross McCausland at, uh, at, at Rangers. I mean, that's a crop of players that you can see in the next five years really making a name for themselves. Of course, it's very easy to say after just one season for a number of these players, but the times that I've seen those players, particularly when I think about Davy Watson down at Kilmarnock, seems to have come from nowhere. Um, but a player who, with each passing week, there seems to be much more importance on how he plays. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, when I, when I knew that we were going to be talking about the young player of the year uh, this morning, I, I, was, I, kind of looked, I was looking at the stats for David Watson and I was looking at the stats for Lennon Miller because those were the two that were immediately in my head. You know, I, I, I've probably seen more of Watson for whatever reason, just random, the games that you tend to cover. And, and I've... I remember being impressed by Watson really early in the season, you know, not least because he scored late winners, a uh, late winner at Petodre, he scored a late equaliser at Parkhead, he scored twice at Parkhead this season, you know. Um, I haven't seen as much of Miller, but uh, in the flesh, I've seen him a lot of on, on television, but I mean, the praise that he, that, yeah, that young lad has been getting has been well deserved. I think he's only, um, he's only 17, I think, uh, Lennon Miller, you know. Um, Watson's a little bit older. But having said all that, it was only when I saw the shortlist come out that I realised Lyle Cameron was still eligible, and I, and I think that's because I, I kind of assumed he was a little bit older. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think Lyle Cameron's a, a terrific talent for Dundee. Um, saw him a few weeks ago against Aberdeen. He virtually ran the show in the midfield. He was straw again against Rangers in the goalless draw uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and I was really disappointed that he had a hamstring injury and couldn't play it at self at. Uh, against Celtic at the weekend. So I, I would be inclined to give it to, to Cameron, but uh, as you say, uh, the other candidates... I think the important thing about them is they're getting a lot of game time, Phil. And this is something that we really bemoan in Scottish football, that the players hit a ceiling of about 18 and their career basically gets a handbrake put on it because they don't get enough game time. Mm -hmm. But uh, Watson and uh, Miller and Cameron especially have had lots of game time. And McCausland has got a fair amount of game time given the competition for places at Rangers. Um, so he's had a he's had a good sort of breakthrough season. But uh, but the other three that I mentioned, especially I think, are are very promising for Scotland because they get a lot of football. Let's turn our attention to Scotland. Uh, Michael, the injury crisis that was beginning to look pretty worrying for the national side, uh, 
some better news around today about Scott McTominay. Um, and I think the very fact that we're focusing on this just proves what a what a massive player he is for Scotland at the Euros this summer. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the injury worry doesn't end until the team runs out in the Munich Stadium on the 14th of June. Let's be honest, we're going to be on tenterhooks because I think a lot of us have been kind of spooked by the run of injuries over the last few couple of weeks, you know, and I think there was a real sort of pit of the stomach feeling when we heard about McTominay. It didn't look good. There was a, there was a rumour doing the rounds yesterday that he was going to be out for three to four months. Yeah. That, that, was, that was getting a lot of traction on social media. And um, coincidentally or not, McTominay himself went on Instagram to say, actually, he's hopeful to be back for United soon. He's calling it he, a hyper extension. I mean, yeah, in, yeah. in old money, Michael, is that just he's sprained his knee? Uh, well, you know, we're not doctors, Phil. You know, <laughs> if we were, we wouldn't be getting up at six thirty in the morning to record football podcast. But, You're right. Uh, that would be, that would be my interpretation of it as <laughs> great media. So, but anyway, listen. The, the you know the great thing is that um, fingers crossed he'll be back. Lewis Ferguson is a sore loss for Scotland. He wasn't a starter, you know. Hickey, we're hopeful still that Hickey will be back. He's a starter, but to have lost McTominay would have been enormous in terms of the blow to Scotland. Seven goals in qualifying last year. Just a, a massive, massive player and influence for for us. If we're to do anything at this tournament, we need the key players, the absolute foundations of the side, and he's one of them. Where might Scott McTominay be playing from a club point of view? Because his future now up for grabs, along with, it seems, the rest of the Man United first-team squad. Quickly on that, do you think a move away from Old Trafford would benefit McTominay either before the Euros or indeed after the Euros? I think you would only be able to answer that if you knew who the manager is going to be next season. Is it a manager that's going to play him more? I think he started 23 times for United this season, which is pretty respectable. 16 more times off the bench. I think he's a pretty important player to, to United, but again, he's he's not one that is beyond upgrading. Mm. If, if United want to, want to get back to where they see themselves as being a Champions League winning uh, club, and that given the scale of them, that's where they should be. I hope that McTominay stays at United. I think, from a Scottish perspective, it's there's like a kind of reflected glory, and we we enjoy our leading players being at the very biggest clubs in England. Um, so you know, if Ten Hag's going to stay, uh, is 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 another manager going to come in and value McTominay more? Listen, he's not going to be short of clubs wanting to take him. Phil, Newcastle, Bayern, Fulham, Inter were all linked with him uh, last summer, and nothing happened. He's Happy to stay at United. Um, I'd, I'd like to see him stay, but I don't think he'd be short of, of offers if he uh, if he was made surplus to requirement. This is the Scottish Football Podcast. Well, let's speak about the tournament and, in particular, about one of Scotland's opponents, uh, Switzerland. Um, Craig, you're you're our expert. You're our eyes and ears of all things Swiss football. What sort of shape is their squad in? The squad's in pretty good shape. There's not really any big injury concerns or anything like that. There was a worry over Jan Sommer and just a few weeks, the last international break, actually, he went off injured. But apart from that, the squad's looking good. It's just the overall form and kind of attitude towards the team at the moment that's flipped massively over the last, from anything we've seen over the last decade. So that's a big concern going forward and kind of the unknown of what to expect from this team usually. You could go into a major tournament always optimistic. You know what you get with Switzerland. You've got a core group of players there that have been there and done it. But yeah, the last kind of 12, 14 months or so has really um, changed that for, for everyone. It's um, not been the best of times, to be honest, and it's it's raised a lot of question marks. And um, it's really difficult to kind of pinpoint what's going wrong with the team. But there's also just a lot of worry about how this team is going to uh, represent on the stage because... Yeah, like I say, it's it's we've been so used to knowing exactly what we'll get from Switzerland, but this time around it's uh, a lot different, and it can go two ways. You've, we'll get the Switzerland we've always had, which has been ultra consistent, or one that kind of disappoints, which is not something that's happened since before twenty fourteen. Craig, we were speaking there about Scott McTominay as being a key man for Scotland. Who are the key men in the Swiss side that'll take on Scotland on the nineteenth of June? Well I think there's that core group that I alluded to where you've got guys like Jan Sommer and Granit Xhaka, um players like that and of course Sherdan Sakiri who have been there and done it all since twenty fourteen. They've they've been to the last this will be the sixth tournament in a row. 
they've made with Switzerland. So again, ultra consistent. Shakiri especially because he's. I think the, the stat I seen before was that he's contributed a, a goal or assist in just under twenty five percent of the goals that Switzerland have scored since he made his debut in twenty ten, which is like two hundred sixty two hundred fifty nine goals, and he scored uh, thirteen goals or assisted and. No, that's 28 goals that Switzerland have scored at a major tournament. So his influence, even though he's kind of winding down his career, he's playing in America now, he's still massive for the team. He's going to be really important. And then we've also got uh, Zeki Amdouni coming through, who's playing at Burnley now. He had a, a fantastic season with a, a struggling Basel side last year. He kind of dragged them to the Conference League semi-final. He scored something like seven goals in eight games in the uh, knockout rounds of the Conference League. And... For once, Switzerland kind of have an out-and-out striker now that they've not had since maybe the days of uh, Alexander Fry. So that's promising as well. And there's a lot of kind of young players coming through or players that are still young, like uh, Ruben Vargas or Noah Okafor, who plays with uh, Milan and uh, Serie A. He's been scoring goals as well. So there is goal threats in this team. And um, as I say, a lot of kind of experience and know-how of the last 10 years or so, they've made every knockout stage of every tournament they've been at and they, they know how to get it done. And Craig, how do fans in Switzerland view their match with Scotland? Do they do they see Scotland as, as the side in the group that they expect to take points from? Or do they view Scotland as, as an unknown quantity? I think there's definitely been a, a little bit of arrogance from the Swiss side. I, I think mainly because Scotland haven't really, well, they've not been at tournaments apart from Euro 2020 and they kind of underperformed there, had had a good game against England, but they would have hoped to have performed better in that group. Um, so, yeah, I think because Switzerland have done so well and are so used to the success of getting out of the group, regardless of who's in the group, they've, they've had some big teams in there, Brazil twice, Serbia twice, Cameroon are always a difficult difficult game. They've played Ecuador in 2014. They've had France in a couple of other groups as well, and they've always managed to come out of the group. So that expectation is only growing every every major tournament, and again that will be the ex- expectation here. So this group, it's to me, it's wide open. I think most um, people would say that, apart from Germany, who aren't playing particularly well, it's kind of very very even. So I think Switzerland fans kind of will look at Scotland and think we can get a win here, but I think there is a degree of uh, underestimating them because. As we know, Scotland have been fantastic in the, in the qualifying. They beat Spain, of course. So, yeah, I think there is a, a degree of arrogance there. Michael, we like that, don't we? We're coming up against the side that are arrogant and think that we are the group whipping boys. <laughs> well, it's our job to prove them wrong, you know. <laughs> um, I, I, I thought from almost from the moment the draw was made that this <clears throat> the Scotland-Switzerland game is going to be enormous for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because... Let's be realistic. We are probably going to open the group with a defeat. Um, really, my, Michael? Yeah, really? I, yeah, you know something? Yeah. I'm I'm sorry, and I bow to your knowledge, but of all three matches, I'm much more comfortable with the opening game against Germany. Yeah, I, well, I genuinely you, am. You know what? So was I until I saw their form in the March friendlies. Um, they beat France away very convincingly. Uh, they then beat Holland. And it just looked like a side that had clicked all of a sudden, which wasn't the way they were looking at up until those two uh, friendly. Now, you, listen, you're right, and we all know that there's a there's a, a an encouraging tradition of opening games tossing up upsets, you know. Mm. So I'm not saying that it's, it's beyond Scotland to take something from the opening game, but I do think it's probable that they would lose it, um, and if they do then suddenly, you know what these tournaments are like. If you lose your opening game, then all of a sudden, you know, in the space of 90 minutes, you're suddenly looking at an exit door opening. Yeah. You know, it's a real pressure situation that a team is put under. Um, but that that then applies an awful lot of uh, pressure on that Switzerland game because Hungary are no mugs. I mean, Craig will have... Will have uh, will have realised that as well from looking at it from from Switzerland's perspective that Hungary are strong strong side now, um, so I, I'll be honest I was a little bit discouraged by Switzerland's recent recent two results because um, their form had been poor but then a draw away to Denmark was is is very respectable and then to go and win in Ireland I, but, listen better two results in March than we got 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's un, unmistakable. Uh, Craig, before I go, and very, very quickly, um, split loyalties for you come June the 19th, but but does your heart rule your head when it comes to Scotland against Switzerland? Um, my emotions have changed on it about 700 times uh, since, <laughs> since the draw was made. Um, normally, I would think Switzerland have the kind of know-how not to, to lose that game, but then you could have said the same about Scotland. Um, but I think it, it'll be a really tight game. I, I think it'll be close. I, I really can't pick a winner. I, don't, I think it will be a draw. See that? You, you know how to keep us all in check and, and all on site, Craig. It's a <laughs> valuable, valuable commodity in the murky world of social media that you operate in. Uh, we're going to leave it there. Craig King, uh, Swiss football expert, uh, Michael Grant, expert of all football when it comes to uh, his correspondent duties with the Times. Thank you for joining me today. Remember, we're back tomorrow, first thing tomorrow, with another daily dose of the Football Podcast. Uh, Make sure you follow us and subscribe so that you don't miss out. Uh, For now, though, enjoy our beautiful game, and we'll talk again soon. Just a quick reminder, the Behind the Goals podcast is available every Tuesday with me, Rachel Corsi, and me, Leanne Crichton. It's your one-stop shop for our take on everything that's happening in the world of football. Just head to BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcasts and search for Behind the Goals.